Hi folks. I know all of you must have looked at the the title of my video and wondering as to the reason how could I say such a thing about Almighty God? Some of you may be thinking I'm a blasphemer because of the title of my video. And some of you might be thinking that I have lost my faith in God and became an atheist. <laughs> well, let me let me assure you that uh, none of that is true. In the dying words of Polycarp, who was the disciple of the Apostle John, how could I blaspheme my God who has saved me? I want you all to know that I love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And by His grace and power, I will always love Him, serve Him, obey Him, and worship Him, and be faithful and true to Him now and for all eternity. By His grace and power, I will never forsake Him or blaspheme Him. By God's grace and power, never going to happen. I have seen the goodness and the graciousness of God on a daily basis, and uh, He is not... And he has met not just my needs, but also the needs of my family, as well as the needs of my brothers and sisters in Christ. So then you may be wondering, why am I talking about God being terrible? It's because this precious book, King James Bible, says so. Now notice that I, that I said the King James Bible. If I said the Bible says so, one would assume that every translation of the Bible say that God is terrible. Well, in this video, I want to show you, and by God's grace, I will show you, that only the King James Bible, God's perfect and preserved word in the English language, uses the word terrible to describe Almighty God. If you're a King James Bible follower of Christ, you know where I'm going with this. You know, in our daily conversation, when we speak or hear something that is bad, we would say, that's terrible. So one would assume that when the King James Bible uses the word terrible to describe God, it is saying that he is bad, mean, or cruel. Well, I want to show you, the viewing audience, in this video, that the King James Bible presents quite the opposite view when it uses the word terrible to describe Almighty God. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines the word terrible this way. Number one, frightful, adapted to excite terror, dreadful, formidable. And number two, adapted to impress dread, terror, or solemn awe and reverence. The word terrible is mentioned 52 times in the King James Bible, 51 in the Old Testament, and only once in the New Testament. The lone reference in the New Testament is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 21, which says, And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. This is in reference to what happened on Mount Sinai, Recorded in Exodus chapter 19 and verses 16 to 19. If you have your King James Bible, please follow along. Exodus chapter 19 and verses 16 through 19. And it came to pass on the third day of the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long, and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him, by a voice. Moses saw God's glory descend descended on Mount Sinai, and it did fill him with dread, terror, and solemn awe and reverence. No wonder the text said in Hebrews twelve twenty one that Moses quaked. If we saw God descend upon Mount Sinai, 
we will be we would be terrified and be filled with fear and reverence. It's only fitting that the first mention of the word terrible is in the book of Exodus, and it's located in chapter 34 and verse 10. Allow me to read from verse 6 of this chapter. Exodus chapter 34 and verses 6 through 10. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us. For it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for that inheritance. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant. Before all the people I will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Moses saw the terribleness of God, that the sacred text says that he made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. This passage in Exodus presents two important truths that I want to present when we consider the terribleness of God. The first important truth is that God is terrible simply because of who He is. I will now back this up with Scripture, and I strongly encourage you all, my brothers and sisters in Christ, to please look them up for yourselves. Pause this video if you have to, to check if what I'm saying is true. All right, here we go. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 21. Thou shalt not be affrighted at them, for the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 5 And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 32 Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keepeth covenant and mercy, Job chapter 37 and verse 22. Fair weather cometh out of the north. With God is terrible majesty. Psalm 47 and verse 2. For the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. Psalm 68 and verse 35. It says, O God, thou art terrible out of thy holy places. The God of Israel is he that giveth strength and power unto his people. Blessed be God. And Psalm 99 verse 3 says, Let them praise thy great and terrible name, for it is holy. Those eight passages shows us that God is terrible because of his holiness, his greatness, and his majesty. He is the great king who reigns in heaven and over all the earth. In Deuteronomy, Moses said that God is God of gods and Lord of lords. He is the one true and living God who deserves to be praised, worshipped, adored, and loved. Nehemiah said that God is so merciful and that he keeps the covenant that he made with his people. In other words, God is trustworthy and we can depend upon him in everything. When we love honor, worship, and obey God, He will bless us. It is His nature to bless His people, but only when we love Him and observe His commandments. Here's a second important truth when we consider 
the terribleness of God. God is terrible because of what he has done. Here's some scripture to back this up. And again, please look them up for yourself to see if what I'm saying is true. Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 21. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things, which thine eyes have seen. Psalm 45 and verse 4. And in thy majesty ride prosperously, because of truth and meekness and righteousness. And thy right hand shall teach thee terrible things. Psalm 65 and verse 5 says, By terrible things in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are far off upon the sea. Psalm 66 verses 3 to 5 says, Say unto God, How terrible art thou in thy works! Through the greatness of thy power, shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. All the earth shall worship thee, and shall sing unto thee. They shall sing to thy name. Come and see the works of God. He is terrible in his doing toward the children of men. Psalm 76 and verse 12 says, He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is terrible to the kings of the earth. Psalm 106 verses 21 and 22 they forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt, wondrous works in the land of Ham, and terrible things by the Red Sea. Amazing. Psalm 145 and verse 6, the last one. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. Those seven passages of Scripture testify that God is terrible because of the amazing things he has done. In Genesis 1, we read that God created the world out of nothing in six days, culminating in the creation of man. In chapter 19 of that same book, we read about how God destroyed the twin cities of Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sodomy that took place there. In Exodus, we read about God creating the nation of Israel and by his terrible acts, he set his chosen people free from slavery in Egypt. Psalm 106, 22 alludes to the mighty hand of God uh, parting the Red Sea to allow Moses and the children of Israel to pass through on dry ground to reach the other side. When Pharaoh and his army attempted to chase after them, God closed the Red Sea and they were drowned. God is terrible in his deliverance of his people from their enemies and in his judgment on the nations and individuals that are in rebellion against him. Before I continue on, I just want to take this opportunity to kick at those modern satanic Vatican versions. We often hear the argument from well-meaning Christians who read the modern versions that it doesn't matter what translation that we read because they're all saying the same thing. Almost two months ago, my wife and I talked with a pastor of a Pentecostal church about the Bible version issue. He himself re reads mainly from the New King James Bible. We share with him why we read the King James Bible alone. And his response is typical of one who is so ignorant of the whole Bible version issue. He said that it doesn't matter which translation of the Bible that we read, it is, it's still the Word of God. Really? Well, I'm going to put his theory to the test in this Bible translation comparison using Psalm 47 verse 2 as I already quoted. Okay, Psalm 47 verses 1 and 2. In the King James Bible it reads this, O clap your hands, all ye people, shout unto God with the voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is terrible. He is a great king over all the earth. In the New King James, it reads, O oh, clap your hands, all you peoples, with an S at the end. Shout to God with the voice of triumph, for the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. 
And perhaps the most popular of these modern satanic translations is the New International Version. Psalm 47, 1-2, it reads in the NIV, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great King over all the earth. We use the word awesome in our daily vocabulary to describe something great. We use that word to, to describe God, and yes, He is awesome. I'm certainly 100% in agreement with that. However, the fact of the matter is that the word awesome is not found in the King James Bible. I did look up, di I did look up that word on both the online Bible and eSword, and not one scripture reference to that word. However, you will find the word awe in three places in the King James Bible. And they're all in the book of Psalms. Psalm chapter 4 and verse 4. Um, Psalm, 30, Psalm, 30, Psalm 33 verse 8. And Psalm 119 verse 161. The words awesome and terrible mean two totally different things. We saw earlier that the word terrible is defined as frightful, dreadful, formidable. Adapted to impress dread terror, and psalm, awe, or reverence. The word awesome is defined this way as I search for its meaning on Google. Here's its definition. Awesome. Extremely impressive or daunting. Inspiring great admiration, apprehension, or fear. When we consider the holiness of God, His greatness, His omnipotence, His glory, and the amazing things that he has done, we shouldn't be just extremely impressed or have great admiration. No, we should be filled with holy dread and solemn awe and reverence because God is terrible. When Rahab the prostitute received the two spies in, of Israel in Jericho, she completely understood how terrible God is. Joshua chapter 2 verses 9 to 11. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side Jordan, Sion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Rahab and the people of Jericho were filled with fright, dread, and terror after hearing how God fought for the Israelites in destroying the Amorites. She knew that Jericho was next in line for God's judgment, that she pleaded to the two spies um, for her, that her life and her family be spared. Well, praise God, Rahab's life and her family were spared in spite of God's judgment on Jericho. And she's not only a part of our Lord's messianic genealogy, but also in the hall of faith. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5 reads, And Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab, and Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Hebrews chapter 11 verse and verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. Praise God. All that we read about God in the King James Bible is not to inspire great admiration for Him or to be extremely impressed with Him, but to impress dread, terror, and solemn awe or reverence, because God is not only a great God and a holy God, but He's also a terrible God. The King James Bible, once again, is spot on when it uses the word terrible in its description of God Almighty because it gives a deeper meaning and glorifies God for who He truly is. 
things that are different are not the same. The amazing truth that God is terrible is revealed in its totality at the cross of Calvary where His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was crucified and died for our sins. It's true that the cross is the greatest proof of God's love, but that's not the only thing. The cross is also the greatest proof that God is a holy, righteous God who hates sin. He is also a God of justice and judgment, and His holy nature demands that sin must be punished. The Apostle Paul explains why in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Romans 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. This is why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, There is none righteous, no, not one. And in verse 23 he explained, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You see, folks, we deserve God's justice and judgment because every one of us has offended a holy and terrible God. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, took our place on Calvary's cross where He died to pay the death penalty for our sins that we could never pay. Romans chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man someone even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I love 1 John chapter 4 and verses 9 and 10. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. For he, God, made him, Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Praise His name. Because the Lord Jesus was sinless, he was qualified to be the ultimate sacrifice for sin. It was at the cross of Calvary that the Son of God became the object of God's holy wrath. He was truly the Lamb of God that was slain for the sins of the whole world. Instead of the justice that we deserve, we receive His mercy as our Lord's death on the cross satisfied a holy and terrible God. The greatest proof of that took place three days after his death, when the Son of God rose bodily and triumphantly from the grave. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 4 and verses 24 and 25, But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for offenses and was raised again for our justification. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Because of what the Lord Jesus has done through his death on the cross and his bodily resurrection, three days later, he bridged the gap between a holy and terrible God and sinful humanity. We can receive forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and peace in our souls when we, when we approach God as repentant sinners and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. For those of us who are saved and redeemed by the blood of Christ, the day is coming very soon when we will see the reality of the terribleness of God, when we will see the face of our precious Lord, who will call us home at the pre-trib rapture to be with Him in glory forever. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13 says, Looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verses 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. For those who reject the Lord Jesus, they will be left behind and experience the terror of God in His judgments upon the earth during the seven-year period known as the time of Jacob's trouble or commonly called the Great Tribulation. And, it's, and it culminates in the second coming of Jesus Christ to, earth, to the earth as the all-conquering King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This is that great and terrible day of the Lord that the Old Testament prophet Joel predicted. Joel chapter 2 verses 28 through 31. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Revelation chapter 6 and verses 12 through 17. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree cast it on untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. The book of Revelation presents the complete picture of Jesus Christ in all his fullness and glory. He is the flesh and blood proof that God is terrible because he himself is God, a holy and terrible God from all eternity. This is why the Apostle John was filled with great fear and reverence when he saw the terrible sight of the risen Christ. Revelation chapter 1 and verses 10 through 18. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the, the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of those candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the past with a, gir with a golden girdle. His head, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes was a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. And his, voice was as, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. 
And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Glory to the Son of God. No wonder John fell at his feet as dead when he saw the glory of Christ, who is the great and terrible God in the flesh. The Lord Jesus will be, will be revealed in his fullness for the whole world to see. And in the last verse of Revelation 6, we see that those who reject the Son of God will be filled with sheer terror and dread, knowing that his judgment will be executed. Those who reject Christ will stand at the great white throne judgment, where they will be judged and sentenced to eternity in the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, and verses 11 through 15 says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When we really consider how terrible God is, it should cause us to be filled with a holy dread, fear, and a solemn reverence and awe. Psalm 33 verse 8 says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Romans 3.18 says there is no fear of God before their eyes. It's not only true of those who reject God, but sadly, it is true of those who are in the church. Sadly, we don't hear pastors or Bible teachers speak or preach about the importance of fearing God. Psalm 111 verse 10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 1 7 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is an entirely different subject, but I want to say this. We must fear God because He is a holy, great, and terrible God who has done amazing things. We need to have that same attitude Moses had when he saw the glory of God descending on Mount Sinai. Notice that he was filled with fear dread and solemn awe and reverence. But the sacred text also tells us that Moses didn't run away from God. No, he made haste and worshipped him and had communion with him. He spent 40 days and 40 nights in fellowship with God on Mount Sinai. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear Fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Moses had a healthy and holy fear of God that he drew close to him. And that is the attitude we must all have as his children. God's presence is not confined to a building. He is omnipresent. Psalm 139 verses 7 and 8 says, Whither should I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. It makes no difference where we go. He is there. This is why we really need to be careful uh, with what we say and what we do. Because we're always in the presence of God since he's there. We must have the holy fear of displeasing him. And when we do mess up in sin, confess it and repent before God and move on. May we all live and walk in the fear of the Lord, knowing 
that he truly is a mighty God and terrible. Amen. Your comments, your insights are always welcome. I love to hear from you. And um, until next time, God willing, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.